Hey, everybody. We're live, and there's some new faces on the show. Andy, take it away. What time is it? What time is it? It's prime time. It's prime time. What time is it? What time is it? It's prime time. Don't look so scared, Charlie. Hey, everybody! Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's Tuesday, and that means prime time. Tonight, please welcome our special guest, Director of Wood Sourcing and Operations, Mr. Charlie Redden. Hey, Charlie. Howdy, everyone. <laughs> and say hello to Lindsay Love. Lindsay What's up, everybody? What's up, Lindsay? What's up, everybody? And our special, special host with the most, Mr. J. <laughs> What's up, everyone? Prime time. Prime time. Andy. Andy, it's like a whole new show. We got new people and we got all this kind of stuff. It's weird, right? Yeah. New I show. mean, I mean, last week, welcome back, everyone, to Taylor Primetime. You know, holy smokes, we're blowing up in the feed already. Uh, last week, as a lot of you know, we lost our dear, dear, my sidekick, Chris Sharpie. We call him Sharpie, the left-hander with the most, right? I don't know how we're going to do some left-handed jokes, but we're going to have to slide them in there. That's for sure. Uh, so, so it was a shout out to Sharpie. I hope you're watching. This is what it's really like to watch primetime Sharpie. <laughs> I know you're out there somewhere, but we would love to welcome the ever so talented Lindsay Love to the show. She is our new third. Hey. She's the, hey, she might take over as the most popular person on the show next to you. Uh, yeah, well. I mean, it is what it is. She's mm. okay. We'll get back to that. Charlie Redden, welcome to Taylor Primetime, Director of Wood Sourcing and Operations. That's a whole lot of stuff, and we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, tonight's episode is about learning how trees become guitars. It's a nerd session. Uh, okay, so welcome to Taylor Primetime once again. It's the 17th episode. Epic. It's epic. It's fantastic. We've done 17th things. You, you made it, Jay, if I may interject, you made yeah. it sound really ominous by saying we lost Sharpie. Mm. We didn't really lose him. He just. Well, he took off and went to make off. beer. He's yeah, he's going to make beer now. He's making beer now. Yeah, that's he's cool. He's drinking beer. He's making beer. He's probably enjoying a beer and he's going to watch Charlie take take off in yeah. a minute. It's going to be amazing. Um, yeah, that's a lot, lot better than him being dead. <laughs> well, yeah, he's not. That is not happening. First of all, you can't if you're Sharpie. Like Sharpie is, like the guy can do anything. And right now he's floating to his kitchen. He doesn't even look like he's walking. He just opened the fridge, he grabbed a beer, and he's trotting back to watch us. So I think he's. I think he's. He's still stroking his beard a little bit. He does and probably know. chuckling. Yeah. His beard is probably one of the greatest beards I've ever seen. I mean, we got a lot of great beards at Taylor. Anyway, okay, wait. He has one of the best. He does have one of the best beards. Yeah. That, is, that is for sure. And speaking yeah. of small talk, hey, Andy, we have a Hug Your Haters tonight. So do you have a little tune for us? Right. And it's the timing. <laughs> it's perfect, Jay. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Everybody needs a hug these days. Maybe now more than ever. Remember, keep your hugs distant or virtual. Stay safe. Don't take haters, babe. Get right to 
the subject Hold your banter And hug your hater today From at least six to ten feet away Social distancing hug song, uh, hugging your haters. We hear you loud and clear. Someone did write us uh, for the 52nd time. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, limit the small talk and the bantering in the beginning. No one really cares about that. This is a nerd talk show. So uh, sorry, but we're going to banter just a bit. We will time code from now on in the description <laughs> of the live feed once it's not live any longer to tell you where the discussion topic happens how's that so this is a digital hug we love you for watching but we're gonna have some banter so sorry so sorry for that okay let's get to it charlie redden director of wood sourcing and operations what in the heck do you do yeah, that's a good question uh i source wood <laughs> and i do operations um, it's, it's actually quite fascinating. You know, when you think about what, what raw materials it takes for us to make a guitar, uh, a lot of these species grow in really interesting places around the world in Central America and Central Africa. And, um, it takes quite a bit. In fact, in many places, it takes a village to get that tree out and for us to cut it up into a guitar part. And, um, and because of the complexity that goes into that, um, and, and the amount of work that it takes for us to transform a tree into a usable part um, along the way, it requires a team of us to really, you know, keep an eye on the factory and keep an eye on the forest and work with our suppliers and the different governments that go in and working with Bob and Andy and, and on, on new products and things like that. It's, it's very complicated and there's very, very long lead times in some of this. So, um, it's, it, it's essentially taking that, that tree from the forest floor all the way up to the point where we're ready to turn it into a guitar. And uh, it's very fascinating along that path and, um, and it's quite complex. So it's, uh, you know, trying to summarize that operation or that sourcing part in, you know, 30 seconds is really complicated and really difficult, but it's really fascinating and super cool. So, so when you, you know, early on in your career, what made you want to do this? I mean, did you ever think, first of all, that you would be sourcing wood for a, a large guitar manufacturer? You know, I suppose I wouldn't have put it past, you know, my younger self that that's something I'd be doing. I'm just crazy enough to go to these places and kind of camp out in the forest. And I think <laughs> just smart enough to know how to get it out and get it to a factory. So um, I wouldn't have put it past myself, but certainly I never would have you know, thought that I would be um, an expert in sourcing wood for guitars. No, I studied economics and I love math and logic. And, you know, some of these uh, tasks that we have to do are far from that. So um, it's just something that we've, you know, we've grown into as a small guitar company years and years ago. Um, you know, we could get mahogany and ebony and some of these other species from our local wood distributor who did the hard work for us. But as we've grown and we've gotten a lot bigger and our volume sustains that and um, the risks go up, um, it, you know, it's something that you just kind of grow into. And that's kind of what what's happened here. So uh, myself and my team have kind of grown around this very niche, very specified um, trade to get guitar wood out of the forest and onto your guitar. And it's uh, it's it's not really something people would think that that's that, that that's a, a career. Uh, but the reality is that all the stuff that we buy and all the stuff that we consume comes from somewhere. And, um, and someone's got to do that work. Yeah, it's intense. When I first started working at Taylor, I didn't even think it was that complex, right? You, ne you never really know. You don't think about it. You're a guitar player sometimes, and you're like, yeah, it's a guitar. And I know that it has maybe spruce on the top and maybe some other, you know, maybe mahogany on the back or in sides, or maybe rosewood or maple, so on and so forth. But I didn't ever appreciate how difficult it may or may not be to go there and get it um how many different countries have you been to oh i probably probably around 50 
Um, most of them, most of them are equatorial countries, right? So in Central America and Central Africa. Um, yeah, about 50 different countries um, sourcing wood and every country is different. Every wood is different. Every village is different. So it's, it's, it's very fascinating. So a, a lot of you who watch the show, I mean, you've answered some quick trivia questions about where we, for example, source ebony. Um, so Cameroon. And um, we uh, are partners in a, a, a mill in Cameroon called Creeley Cam. And Charlie, you ran it for, uh, in the beginning, correct? Yeah, when we, when we first partnered with Medinter, um, I moved to Cameroon and lived there for two years to help get this new company off the ground and doing business in a way that can sustain uh, guitar production for, for the future. And, uh, you know, living in a, a central West African country is much different than, than living in the US or Europe, right? Jay, you've been there, so you, you have an idea of what it's like. And, um, and so doing business in a country like that is a challenge. Um, living in a country like that's a challenge, but it's incredibly rewarding, especially now, 10 years, almost 10 years into our, our venture in this. Wow. It's incredibly successful now. Um, they're, you know, the, our, our employees are running the factory on their own and, um, you know, they've just grown so much and they've come so far and, and, and we have too an understanding, you know, what it takes to, to really do a good job in, in central West Africa. And, um, you know, it's, it's just mind blowing when you think about having a guitar with an ebony fingerboard and man, the stories I could tell you about how we got that fingerboard on your guitar would just. You know, it's just, it's unbelievable. It would be something like, well, yeah, we had to, to go to Mars and we took a trip to Venus on the way back and picked up some moon rocks and, you know, and, and really that's kind of what, it, what it's like doing business in a place like that. It, it, he's right. I have been there. I'm working on a, you know, a feature documentary on, on what we're doing over in Cameroon. And that is, it's pretty much right. Hey, we're going to go out into the bush or the forest where we, where we procure, ah, uh, single ebony tree and it's it's like the stories you hear i mean correct me if i'm wrong it's like you drive for a day until the road ends and then then what then what happens? yeah <laughs> then you camp for another two days in the sweltering heat you know and uh yeah it's a week before you get back to to cell phone range it's pretty incredible yeah it's it's, it's pretty amazing to get a, 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 a massive thing and and you know maybe you can walk through i know that some of the folks here have known they know the story about when bob went over there and was walking over trees that had fell and you know he was looking at them and asking why were you on that trip when bob first went to the forest and saw all the trees just not being used no i i was on the trip the the very next trip after that and, um, and I saw, and I, you know, when he said that, I kind of thought to myself, well, I know that ebony has its, its discolorations or it's got its different colors, you know, just like any tree um, or any species, but actually watching the, the Sawyers cut those trees down and then leave them there because they're not jet black was just heartbreaking. Mm. And, um, and I, I know that that's the way Bob felt when he saw it too. And, and it's just an incredible opportunity for us to for us to communicate to the world that, you know, that the trees that we, we cut down are, are not plantation trees that grow in huge groves like broccoli. These things are you know, hard to find and they're out there. And when you cut one down, you want to, you know, you want to use everything that, that that tree is capable of providing. And, uh, and so seeing that was a real turning point for us. Um, and I'm really happy that we took that step to use everything the forest has to offer. Yeah, that's really important. Um, and maybe you can explain that a little. What What is that? I mean, Bob talks about that quite often, but maybe in, 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 in your words, can you explain, you know, Bob has that checklist of sustainability, what it means to become more sustainable as a company, so on and so forth. But what does it mean to use all the wood? Yeah, so, you know, I, I try to explain um, to those who, you know, I, I work a lot with loggers who know how to cut a tree down and transport the tree. And then I work a lot with, you know, guitar makers or carpenters who know how to take those slabs of wood and turn it into something beautiful. Um, 
but I think that there's a major disconnect kind of like in our food supply where we don't really know much about the cow, um, you know, and how our beef is produced. And so, you know, like in the, in, in the food industry, um, we want to use every bit of that we can. And a tree isn't any different than any other living thing on the planet. Um, there's parts that are commercially viable, like, you know, the trunk of the tree as an example. Um, and then there are parts that are not like the bark or the pith, the center of the tree, um, the branches and leaves and things like that. And, um, you know, unfortunately we don't build a guitar that has branches and leaves coming out of it. If we did, then we would have a great source for some of these other things. Um, but what we do is, is rather than just, you know, eating, eating the heart and throwing away the rind is we, we work really hard to figure out how we can use all of that tree. And so as an example, um, Trilicam is a perfect example of this. And we do this all over the world, not just in Africa, but we do it in Central America as well. Once we've taken the wood from the, the tree that we can use for a guitar, um, we, you know, we have this, uh, Bob has this incredible ability to look at what's left and commercialize that. And, and I think Bob's, um, you know, his philosophy in, in sustainability is that sustainability only happens if it's economically sustainable. And it's a really good point, you know, if without, without the economics of, of, of the money that's turning over, there is no incentive and there is no, um, you know, there's no reason for us to, to continue to find these things that we can, we can make out of the whole cow or the whole tree. And, and so, um, you know, our Stella Falone product line, the, the kitchen wares, you know, was born out of trying to use what was left over from, from making a guitar. And, um, and so many other industries do the same thing. You know, they use the small scraps or the sawdust or the bark, and they use that to fuel their factories and so on. And, um, and so we're always on the lookout for that, no matter what species it is or what country we're in, we're always looking for those kinds of things. How can we make it economically viable uh, to make the sustainability work by itself? Yeah, it's funny. I, Lindsay probably saw it too. There was a question in here and, and I passed it, but I mm -hmm. it something like this. How in the heck did you guys get into making <laughs> cutting boards? Right? So, <laughs> uh huh. That was a good segue right there. And I believe when, when Bob, Bob, I witnessed it uh, in our Tecate factory, they process a lot of the fingerboards that come from Cameroon, all the, the wood, right? And Bob, I was, you know, following, you know, Uncle Bob around and, and he's always <laughs> this wealth of knowledge or storytelling. It's very inspiring when you're with him. And we went to this one area of the factory where they taper the, the, the fretboard. And so there's these little tiny strips right next to it and they're all sitting in a trash can, but they're not going to be thrown away. No, Bob said, you know what those are perfect for? Chopsticks. Yep. <laughs> and I looked at it and I was like, the smallest piece of wood on the planet and Bob just, you know, he finds a way to like, yep, we got to use that. We got to use every single little bit of that. That's interesting. So let's bring I, this back. I have a set of prototype chopsticks that he made yep. years ago. Mm -hmm. You have prototype chopsticks? I do. And he had me take some over to, um, part of my job is I travel over to Asia and I, I work with sales and distributors over in Asia. And so he had me take them over and give them away as gifts. And just to, it's just to show you how nerded out he gets with stuff like that, Jay, it, we visited a chopstick maker in Japan because <laughs> he wanted to see how it was done. And this is a, a you know, a, a traditional kind of, older school Japanese business that's been in the family for, you know, since it's the third generation, fourth generation. And there's three or four guys sitting around with belt sanders, really like making five sided, seven sided, just like all by in their hands, like no CNC machinery. And he was just like, I could never do that, you know, but he's that <laughs> into it. And we sat down and we talked to the chopstick maker and his wife and right next to it, when they served us coffee, they had this huge slab of ebony that had variegation in it. It was blonde and black. Yeah. And and they go, yeah, we've been we've been telling people about ebony for thirty years. Mm. <laughs> it was it was a really it was a moment where he just was like, wow, I'm not the only one. You know? <laughs> so good. yeah. So Charlie, that's that's awesome. Chopsticks. So who knew? We also <laughs> maybe we'll make chopsticks. Stella Falone will make chopsticks someday, and that'll be amazing. Um. Okay. So. Back to wood, back to all, not just ebony, but but everything. So often when we give a tailor a tour, a factory tour, um, when we're open 
to the public and we're not in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we get the question, how long does it take to build a guitar? Right. And now think about adding the process of building in the factory to your job and go all the way back and get, get the wood that's going to build the guitar. How long does it take from sourcing to bringing it to the factory, sourcing all the different species, bringing them to the factory? And what are the processes? Do we dry them? Do we acclimate them to the climate? What happens? Right. So it depends on the species. And, um, you know, as an example, something like uh, ebony, you know, we, we carry two years worth of inventory of ebony. And, you know, so the, my supply chain colleagues out there are thinking that's the opposite of just in time. Like that's the worst thing you can do. And, you know, but the reality is it's, it's a natural resource kind of like oil and you can't run low on it. And uh, there's a huge risk that goes along with sourcing those things. Not to mention um, from the time that they fell a tree in the forest. In fact, let's back up from the time they prospect a tree in the forest. Uh, so this is a guy who gets in a truck and goes out and looking for a tree, finds a tree. Um, from that point, all the way until it becomes ready to be used for a guitar, it could be three years. So, um, and that's for ebony. Some of the other species might not take as long because there's not as much risk or the drying time's better. Um, but it's, it's a very long time. So, you know, there's a lot of planning that goes into what we do. But in addition to that, we have, you know, the complexities of taking a tree out of the forest, um, you know, trucking and roads and, you know, all these other things kind of get, get in the way of even getting that log to a factory that's ready to cut it. And once we cut it, we have to go through the export formalities and, and we bring it into the U.S. So at this point, we could be talking about a year before it actually arrives. Um, we have to process it here and there's lots of, you know, stickering and drying. Ebony takes three months to dry. Um, and then it has to acclimate, like you said, Jay, it's go, it goes through a, you know, a, a cooling off period after it comes out of our kilns and uh, has to, you know, acclimate to its new environment. You have to do all these things before you can build a guitar with it. Um, so, you know, everything that we buy, every species that we buy goes through this process. Um, even with some of the higher volume, more commercial manufacturers, for example, we do business with a company um, that sells us maple and they are top-notch wood processors and these guys have robotics and they have you know um they have um x-ray machines that can see knots in in the tree before it's even cut it's it's remarkable and even they have you know several months on a species like maple that's grown in north america that's relatively close to home and even then when we bring it in we have to process it and and, and inspect it and things like that so you know the sourcing part of our our work in building a guitar, um, you know, it could be, it, it could be anywhere from two to five years before, from the time that we prospect a tree all the way to the point where it's ready to actually build. That's crazy. So where do we get to, we'll say maple, where do we get most of our maple from? Well, most of our maple uh, comes from the U.S. Um, we, we use the Western maple for backs and sides and Eastern maple for necks. Um, our mahogany comes from Central America, mostly right now comes from Guatemala and Belize. And then we have a project with the, um, with a company in Fiji, Fiji, you know, I, I always ask this question as a, um, a bit of trivia, right? It's like, what, what's the biggest export from the Fiji islands? And people are like, well, water, water. right? <laughs> Second biggest one is mahogany, believe it or not. Right. So their, their mahogany exports are, 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 are quite large. And the reason is that they have a full on plantation of genuine tropical mahogany there. And so, you know, being more sustainable and working with, you know, less risky um, parts of the world, it, you know, Fiji was very attractive to us. Um, we buy Indian rosewood from India, naturally. Um, that's a whole different complexity of government auctions and some of the regulations that are involved with, with rosewood is very complicated. Um, and, you know, lots of other species we, we use um, have, they all have their own different, unique circumstances that go with it. Um, but they come from all over the world. I mean, temperate regions and tropical regions. And um, it's just, it's quite fascinating when you take all these things from all over and put them all together into one package. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, often we, we say that, right? Um, Andy and I both came from 
guitar retail. I just had a small stint in guitar retail, and you know we've all shopped for guitars and whatnot. But I'll often you'll often hear when somebody comes in, well, I don't really like that one. It's got <laughs> this weird figure in it or I don't like that one because it looks like this or I don't like that one because it looks like this and I've said it before on the show it it's one of the only things on the guitar is one of the only the acoustic guitar that is is one of the only things on the planet that is all these different species of wood they have to come from all over the world to America to El Cajon they have to acclimate and then we have to put them all together and it turns mm-hmm. into this like beautiful thing. It's 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 super fascinating, and it's always a fun super topic cool. to to discuss. Um, there was a couple of of, of questions in here, mm-hmm. um, and before we get into some uh, some of the Q and A, Charlie, what is the craziest, most dangerous animal you've run into <laughs> in, in your traveling experience? <laughs> uh animal um or I was insect hoping... or it's bugs or what what was it well I, some of the mosquitoes in, in cameroon are like pterodactyls so you know i mean they're pretty dangerous <laughs> i think um the closest thing that i've come to a, like a really dangerous animal we were in the bush in cameroon and we came across a gorilla bed and this is in the wild so it's not like um you know, the gorilla at the zoo. This is a gorilla like in its natural habitat. Mm-mm. And um, Mm-mm. We, we walk past this gorilla bed and we see it and we're like, that is a gorilla bed. And, you know, and the, you know, the guides that were with us were kind of like, look, the gorilla is more afraid of you than you are of the gorilla. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm not going to find out. I, I don't want to no. find that out. So, no. you know, luckily, aside from the mosquitoes and the ants and some of the other bugs, you know, that was probably the most dangerous. And I think the fact that the gorilla wasn't home made it even worse because he could just kind of sneak mm. up behind you if you wanted. So, you know, that was probably most terrifying. Um, you know, if I were face to face with it, I'd probably be having a different story right now. So <laughs> that was definitely an experience. What was the coolest? <laughs> Did you see anything that was like not that harmful? Well, I mean, when you're out in the bush, it's kind of harmful. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, the nature out there is just <clears throat> mind blowing. You know, I mean, you're talking about untouched, you know, just pristine land. That's just uh, it's, it's gorgeous. The waterfalls and the, you know, the tropics really are the most beautiful thing. Um, it's just a real pain to get there and a real pain to get out. But once you're in there, man, it's just unbelievable. It's unbelievable. That's that's amazing. Um, I have a quick story be- before we get into Q&A. But um, when I was in Cameroon, we went out and we were filming, and I'm not, I'm not even going to lie. We had to go back a, a couple of the, our, our production team went back a couple of times because we really had to get a real shot. But we needed a shot, and it was a, of, of planting some trees. And it was um, a little bit staged, I'm not even going to lie. So <laughs> it was a little staged, and we were out there with one of the villages and some of the villagers, and we were walking down this road that wasn't real. It wasn't like a dirt road. It was just a path where at one time they had a vehicle that made some tire tracks. That's what we were talking Once. about here. Okay. Yeah. So I'm walking with one of the one of the one of the Cameroonian fellas who was kind of guiding us, and he was like reaching into the bush and the trees and like picking berries off and just eating them. And I'm like, "Yep, yeah, nope, I'm fine." <laughs> Like, no, everything's fine. You know, he couldn't speak any English. He's speaking French to me. And um, at one point I was standing there and I was holding, you know, a very expensive camera. You know, we're talking very expensive camera. And he came up and tapped me on the shoulder and said, look down. And I looked down and there was like a, some sort of like centipede looking thing like this. And he looked and he went that. <laughs> and I said, okay, 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 I get it. I'll move away from that as soon as I can. Anyway, that was my experience with some crazy stuff. <laughs> out um, but thank you. Thank you for that. We'll get into some Q&A right now. But a lot of people just don't realize how tough it is. It's not an easy thing to do. And you have a lot up here. I know that. Mm. 
right? You have to memorize and understand what species of wood we're using here. And I've seen you in the factory with groups of people as you're looking through every single piece of wood we have. And it's, it's pretty interesting. We're, we're happy to have you on this show. I think it's a little yeah. unappreciated by a lot of customers, Jay. Like when they're standing there at a guitar store saying, yeah, I don't, that one's got a weird mark in it. All right. So Charlie, if we take a, like a guitar, like an 814 CE, or one of our most famous popular guitars, the, the back and sides comes from, it's rosewood. Where does it come from? India. It has maple binding. Where does that come from? North America. It has Sitka spruce top. Where does that come from? Yeah, North America. It has uh, ebony. Prep board. Cameroon. It has other, you know, so it's like it, it was Scott Mahogany Paul, neck. Mahogany, yeah. thank you. Mahogany neck, another one, right? So, um, and some of those pieces of wood are perhaps hundreds of years old. It took, you know, we, we've, when back in the day, you know, you hear Bob talking about going to the hardware store and picking out lumber for to build his next guitar and at that time there were actually pieces of, of spruce that were older than the u.s <laughs> right <laughs> if you count the rings older than the united states that we were using to build guitars with and so it kind of it pees me when people don't take care of stuff that took that mm. long you know we talk about it took three years to dry it but it took a long yeah. time for mother nature i think you know andy that's a really important point i mean a, a lot of the you know we're talking about tone woods, which are hardwood and hardwoods take a long time to grow, especially uh, to be wide enough to make a guitar. You know, um, our camera, the, the trees we cut in Cameroon are probably 60 to 80 years old. Uh, some of the trees that we cut for mahogany are upwards of 150 years old. Um, some of the spruce that we've been cutting, you know, it's a bit younger, but yeah, they're 200 years old. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like these, these, materials are you know they, they far outlive um you know they're just they're hundreds of years old mm. and to finally get that thing all the way here and turned into a guitar that's that's quite the life cycle you know and a lot of the work that we're trying to do is to sustain that um that good forest management for all of those species for the future too so you know it, it's kind of like um building a really old church you know what they did in europe it, you know the guy who laid the first bricks died long before he saw the fi final church built and it's similar to what we're doing here you know it's really really long time so having an appreciation for that i think is is incredibly important and and quite frankly a lot of those small things that you see in wood is what gives it that that character you know that's what makes that that guitar so unique and so special and from where it came so i think that that's that's a really important thing yeah, it's, it is special. Yeah. And Lindsay, it's a living, breathing thing. And what did we learn when we were on your, when you were on the show, before you were a co-host? What did we learn? <laughs> yes. What do take we do with it. guitar, Lindsay? Tell us. Take, yes, take care of it. <laughs> humidity, humidity, humidity. Take care of it. Make yeah. Sure these things are living, breathing things. So Charlie starts. Yeah. He's 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 the root, almost literal. <laughs> of <laughs> the supply chain and now we you have this beautiful instrument in your hand and it's your time to play it and love it but take care of it um all right you guys want to get into some hey you know what's great there's already sports talk in the uh feed over here so apparently the cubs down 2-1 against the against cleveland um, I'm wearing this hat for you, Charlie. I know you're. I appreciate that. Maybe yeah. two minutes of sports, we might ask some baseball questions. It'll be fine. Um, but let's get into some. Let's get into some uh, Q and A. We've got some Q and A that came in through email, and we got some Q and A on the feed over here. Um, there was a really good question. I got to roll back to it. Um, uh, here we go, Charlie. Can you explain? the tracking process when you use Brazilian rosewood? That's a great question. So um, Brazilian rosewood is the creme de la creme for guitar makers. And for, for those of you who really know Brazilian rosewood, um, it was listed on CITES Appendix 1 in 1992. So uh, in other words, it's as endangered and as uh, complicated as something like elephant ivory. So very complicated and very difficult to come by. Um, essentially any, any stock that was, 
that was harvested prior to 1992, they call pre-convention. And with that, you, um, you have to maintain a, a chain of custody through the CITES organization. CITES is the Convention of International Trade of Endangered Species. So they're, they're kind of like the watchdogs to make sure that if you're commercially trading in some of these species that you're doing it properly. And, um, and so maintaining that chain of custody, especially um, from 1992 and onward is quite complicated. Uh, you've got to be really good at your record keeping. And fortunately here at Taylor, we have a dream team of IT folks that can help us digitize these things. And, um, and luckily for us, we're able to trace back our um, Brazilian rosewood guitars and all of our stock um, to that point using the chain of custody that CITES is required of us. So it's, um, it's quite the feat. And, um, you know, Brazilian rosewood is, is a really beautiful, awesome wood for guitars. Um, but, you know, the reality is that it's really difficult to come by. And the reason for that is that it was overexploited. And so the work we're doing today is to prevent things like mahogany or Indian rosewood or some of those others from going on the same listing. But luckily for us, we've got, um, we've got really solid procedures in place to trace our wood back. And, um, and, and I feel really fortunate that we've, hired, we've had that set up ever since then. That's amazing. Lindsay, do you have any questions or Andy? I do. Evan wants to know which tone wood would you say requires the most amount of labor to source? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, Great question. I, I would have to say so, you know, okay, so if we were including the factory that we have in Cameroon, certainly that would be the highest one because we've poured an enormous amount of effort into getting that up and running. Um, but I think that aside from that and that being the outlier, um, it would probably be mahogany. And the reason is, is mahogany is, um, it's geopolitically, it's difficult. For example, we were, we, were, we were sourcing mahogany in Honduras for a long time and the political winds had shifted there. So we were forced to uh, find another country and, and, and to work with it. And you know, luckily Central America is made up of many different countries that, that, that have mahogany, but, um, but they're not all equal in terms of how you can source it and how much you can source and who you can get it from and um, and the governments are involved in that. So we're, we're constantly having to refresh our, um, our sourcing strategy for mahogany because where we're buying it from today may not work out for us next week or next month. And so we have to have these contingencies in place. So that takes quite a bit of effort for us to maintain the level of uh, volume that we use at Taylor um, at the same time um, maintaining all the legality and, and all of the risks that go with it. So mahogany for sure is probably our hardest one outside of Cameroon. Hmm. Huh. Andy, do you have any? Yeah, it's, it's maybe part two of that answer, Charlie, but um, a couple of years ago, uh, the whole industry was hit with the, the big sort of blanket restriction that was put on East Indian Rosewood, uh, which affected all guitar manufacturers, piano builders, anybody in the business who was who was building out of that wood um it has since been lifted but do you see are there other woods that we're accustomed to using um that we may be taking that the average customer may take for granted that you see possible problems with or is, is mahogany the answer or are there other woods that you that you guys are worried about CITES perhaps coming down hard on yeah there there are others um you know, mahogany is probably the, the one at the top of the list. Um, it's already on CITES Appendix 2, which is the, you know, it's not as restrictive as Brazilian rosewood. Um, there are certain clauses in the, in the law that allow us to uh, convert mahogany into a, a part or a guitar, and it, it loses its need for the chain of custody after that. Um, but, um, so mahogany would be at the top of the list. But interestingly, um, spruce is probably one of the, 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 it would be like the surprise species that that has us a little bit nervous. And the reason for that is um, there are only a few regions in the world where spruce grows. Um, in North America, it's on the western side of North America, like Canada and the U.S. Um, but a lot of those lands are protected. And um, there's a lot of export that's happening for pulp and paper in that region. And, you know, Bob Taylor has this great saying, he says, you know, guitar wood doesn't grow on trees. And so he's kind of right, you know, like you can't just walk into the forest and pick a tree and that's going to be a guitar. It's, it's, it's got to be the right tree. And, you know, as, as we start to see more and more 
deforestation and, um, and less, um, you know, forest management, especially for the older growth trees, spruce is becoming more and more of a question mark in terms of how we can um, sustainably build a guitar out of that. Now, do I see that moving on to CITES or being restricted? I mean, yeah, I think maybe someday, but, um, but I'm more concerned about the quality of the spruce that we have and, you know, the, the, the modulary rays in the spruce and the, the, you know, all the things that make what you see today in spruce um, maybe more and more difficult to get because of that. It's so interesting. I could talk about this forever. So it's nerd. We're nerding out. I know. But Andy, do you have any more? Did you say you you had a? You seemed like you had another one. I have one. You want me to go for it? Yeah, go for it. I got this. Okay. Uh, it's like a two part question because somebody said, "Let me find it here." I like streaked ebony too. Uh, is ebony the only fingerboard wood used by Taylor? That was by Roy. And then if you go up here. Jeff said, tell us more about eucalyptus being used <laughs> as fingerboards now. So we do have, we are currently using two different species of wood. Um, let, let's go into, so we answered that question. Let's go into the decision making from your side or from your words on uh, starting to use eucalyptus as a fingerboard wood. Right. So it's, you know, eucalyptus is a great, it, it's just, it's got the same density or very similar density as an ebony. Um, it machines well, it works well, it wears well. Um, you know, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have chosen eucalyptus if we felt like it was not a comparable substitute to ebony. And, um, you know, but the reality of it is that the, the world has a finite supply of ebony. That's the truth. And ebony, unlike eucalyptus, is, is not grown in large plantations. Um, eucalyptus is a faster growing tree and it grows in regions of the world that are a bit easier to do business. Um, so there's, and, and it's more sustainable. So there's, there's this real question of, you know, there's only so many guitars we can make as a, a you, know, you know, not just as Taylor, but the whole guitar and violin and piano making world. There's only so much ebony that's out there. And um, if we want to continue to use um, sustainable materials that, um, that are going to promote good forest practices then, you know, but grow at the same time as a business, we, we have to figure out, you know, how we can, we can use ebony to its fullest potential, but still, you know, have something that we can use um, as we grow. And so eucalyptus was that, that answer for us. It seemed that um, all of the, the attributes of the wood were, were wonderful. So as we start to grow, we, we, we made a decision to say, well, there's a finite supply of ebony that's out there. And um, rather than continuing to tax the same forest over and over again, and then eventually we have none, let's, let's maintain where we are with ebony and, and get that sustainability regrowing. But how do we satisfy the need for more guitars in the world without taxing that, that species? And eucalyptus was the answer to that. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty great. Andy, what do you think about eucalyptus? Um, I enjoy it. It's, I've, you know, it's, I've played the American dream guitars and, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, you know, I don't know that I would have noticed if somebody wouldn't have told me ahead of time that it was a different wood. I don't think I would have even noticed. Uh, uh, there are a lot of comments. People are saying that it's really fast. Um, it feels, it feels really good on underneath their fretting hand. Um, but I think it, it sounds good. It feels solid to me. I don't, I, I'm very happy with it. Um, it smells really good. Yeah, it smells really good. Uh, Lindsay, you're uh, an yeah. incredible jazz player. Um, as a jazz player, how do you feel about eucalyptus? Yeah, I same thoughts as, as Andy. I, I wouldn't have noticed. I mean, it looks, uh, especially because we started using, you know, like eb uh, ebony with, with marks in it and verification, verification in it. So eucalyptus has kind of that same kind of spotty spotty it's not pure jet black so i wouldn't have noticed unless someone said hey this is eucalyptus it played great it definitely it felt good. good it definitely and, it's, and it smells good it's just weird <laughs> yeah, that we're just smelling fretboards <laughs> no it's not weird i smell everything that i go and buy it's just not weird to me <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you don't think it's weird when people smell their guitars absolutely the first thing no definitely not no smell it you know mm. gotta 
I got a brother who smells Snickers bars like there it is. unwraps them. So I, I it's it's cool. Um, uh, so oh. does, here's one a question by Rob. Um, does someone there is there someone involved or in charge of planting trees? That's a very good question. We do have a director of sustainability. What what is his what's Scott's title? His director of resource sustainability. Yeah. Scott so Paul. who's on? He yeah, was... Scott Paul. Was he on? Yeah. yeah. So he he's our guy when it comes to you know replanting. Um, but you know we you know the the it's a very interesting question that we get regularly, which is you know well, when you cut out a tree, do you replant it? And the answer is, man, we'd love to do that with every single tree we cut. The, the, some of the issues are that we're, we're, we don't own the land from which the tree is grown or harvested. So um, while we partner with um, villages and governments and, and companies that have the best sustainability practices that we can find in that region that meet our quality standards, it's a bit out of our control to be replanting every tree that we cut. So um, as the world has become more aware of sustainability and they've started demanding products that um, were responsibly harvested, things like that, it's been really great to have the consumer, you know, back us up when we go and do our sourcing trips to talk about the importance of that. And a lot of them have started to come on board with, you know, we do need a sustainability plan. We do need to figure out how to replant. Um, so it depends on the country. It depends on the species. Um, in Cameroon, we've got a very robust replanting um, program that I'm sure Jay has talked about. Uh, and, and so, you know, we're trying to, to set the model for how business can do both, how we can harvest and also replant, hopefully in a faster rate than we're cutting. And so if we can do that as a, a guitar company, then certainly some of the big forestry guys out there can do it. Um, and so we bring that story with us and it's a really great selling point for us to try to convince some of our partners in those countries to, to continue down that path. Um, in the last, 10 years, I would say we, we've probably went, we've probably gone from, you know, replanting it. It's a forest that replants itself to, yeah, you know what? We're probably cutting more than we, <laughs> than we're regrowing. So how do we figure that out? And so there's been a lot of really positive movement in that direction. That's That's awesome. Hey, I got a question. I got to, I'm take. I'm going to hijack these cute, these questions real quick, but this one's for Andy. This is from Ron. <laughs> we got an email, Andy. Okay. R the Taylor American Dream Series guitar is actually available in stores. It seems like they're all on back order. I want to play some before I buy. I live in Edmond, Oklahoma. There are two places that are Taylor dealers near me. Yeah, um, they are um, in very high demand right now. And um, it doesn't surprise me to hear Ron say that um, because they're probably already sold when the time they get to the stores. And that's something that we're working very hard on. Um, of course, we're handicapped this year by the fact that we were closed for a long time and we got behind on production. And then when we came back to produce guitars, we were forced to use new protocol um, to keep everybody safe. So we're relearning how to build guitars. Um, and it, it, we, yes, they are in stores. We're shipping them. There's a very limited number that are going to be happening to, that will happen to make it to Edmonton. Uh, this Edmond, Edmonton, is that where he is? Edmund, Edmund, um, this year, but uh, but hang in there, Ron, because they're worth it. I've, you know, I've, it's a really cool guitar, and it's just a matter of catching up. Uh, there's a lot of them on back order, um, and we can only make so many every day. That's awesome. I got a question for Lindsay. Okay. Ready, Lindsay? Let's let's do it. Let's see if there's something in there. Ready? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. John Bundy writes, "Hi." That's Hi. It. Just kidding. Okay. Hi. What What's kind, up, John? What kind of humidifier would you recommend for a T5? Um, I know people have put uh, the dampets in there, but we also have the ones that just the, the two-way system that you can fit in the sound hole. The Deodari. Uh, oh, Planet Wave? Yep. Yeah, I think it's the Planet Wave yeah. ones. I did oh, just pull it up. Or, yeah. Yeah, I think it's Planet Wave ones, yep. Also, right. Jay, the Dampet makes um, a, a product for a violin also. Mm -hmm. So the sound, this little F holes, F -hole. little sound holes in the T5 are pretty small. Mm -hmm. um, if, if the person doesn't feel like cramming them in that, that little sound hole, 
there are narrower ones that they can buy too that are made for violins and smaller wooden instruments. That's awesome. All right, Charlie, I got one for you. This is from Scott. What is the what does R and D entail for testing manufacturability manure, manufacturability of a candidate tone wood? So what's what goes into R and D when it comes to choosing tone woods and new tone woods? Yeah, it's a, a great question. Um, you know, we're we're a company that is we don't know until we try, and um, which is what I love because it's it's kind of like uh, the experimental phase of everything we do, and um, yeah, there's certain handful of tone woods that have existed for eternity that we know work well, like mahogany and rosewood and ebony spruce. We know that those are kind of the, the really, you know, the go-to that are out there. Um, but there are so many other species that the world has to offer. And um, I love working for a company that's willing to try those things. And so um, depending on the, um, depending on the density of the wood, um, it's other applications in the marketplace. So if there's other commercial applica applications in the marketplace, that gives us a really good understanding of how the wood might behave. Um, but at the end of the day, if we, you know, we've narrowed this thing down to one or two or three species that we think might be kind of cool and we should try it, um, we make guitars out of it. That's, there's no other way to know until we build one. Um, so the interesting thing is that from the time that we bring this wood in and we season it the way we would normally season anything else, provided that there's no hiccups along the way in that, and usually there are because it's a new species we're not familiar with. Um, we make a guitar and then we put that guitar through, you know, the normal conditions or the extreme conditions that one might, might see to see how the wood is going to react. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I play guitar, but I shouldn't say that out loud working for a guitar company because I'm not that good. <laughs> so when I say I play guitar, what really what I mean by that is I have a few guitars at home that my wife plays, like <laughs> and she's better at it than I am. Um, but, you know, but the folks like Andy and our development team that that really, really are good at this and they know what they're doing, they um, they put that guitar through the ringer to see what it's going to sound like and, and what it's going to behave like. And um, it's been very interesting for us to like eucalyptus is a perfect example. We started working on eucalyptus fingerboards. It's probably been three years, I think. So from the time that we brought it in all the way to the time where we were ready to put it on a guitar for commercial sale it was about three years. And all of that has to do with the, um, the treatment of the wood and then starting over again and then finding out you messed up halfway through it and starting over again. And that's just the nature of it. That's amazing. Lindsay, do you have any questions? I do. I was about to jump in there. This is piggybacking off of your, um, uh, your not all trees can be used, but someone wants to know, let's see, who, where is it at? Just had it. John says it might be difficult to answer and it might, but on average, how many guitars does a tree yield? That's a great question. And it's very difficult to answer. Um, we, so it, it, I'll try to put this in, in, in some kind of an analogy. Um, you know, how many glasses of water would you get out of a puddle? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the size of the puddle, right? Depends on the depth. There's a lot of things that go into it. Um, you know, some trees are much smaller than others and we, we, we can't quite get what we want out of it. Other trees are, are just so big that we, you know, we can get, we can use as much of it as we can. Um, I think that the easier way to answer that question, since we're talking, you know, the unit of measure of a tree is, is a bit difficult because that's like asking how many gallons are in a puddle. Um, but to give you some perspective, a guitar, one guitar, um, takes around four board feet. So, you know, for those of you woodworkers out there, you know, um, you know what a board foot is, but for those who don't, a board foot is, you know, try to imagine the equivalent of a one inch piece of wood that's one inches thick by 12 inches by 12 inches. That's one board foot. So about four board feet to make a guitar. Um, and, uh, and so how many board feet are in a tree? Well, it depends on the size of the tree, it depends on the species, depends on how much rot is in there. And so it's a bit difficult to answer that question, but I, you know, if, if I were to just take a shot in the dark and you, you know, you're imagining this big spruce or mahogany tree sitting in the forest right now with 
giant branches and this big thick trunk um you know that that guy will probably make 500 guitars right so if that helps at all but you know it really depends on what you're imagining as big or small and so it's a really difficult question to answer but um but narrowing down to a unit of measure that we can all understand it's about four board feet for a guitar that's interesting. That's I like so the fact that you know all of these numbers. <laughs> I got a question here by Robert. Um, which top woods can you torify, and why aren't we seeing torfa torfaction on others yet? So right now we're torfying Sitka. Um, other species can be torfied. Uh, we haven't quite found a good reason to torfy anything else. Um, you know, spruce is probably the most important part of a guitar. That soundboard is really like what makes that guitar ring. Um, so there hasn't been a, a need really to torify other parts of the guitar. Um, it, it would be an additional cost that may not have a benefit to it. Um, so right now, you know, we, we are kicking around torifying other species just to see what, how they react and what they look like and what they, you know, how they play. But right now, uh, Sitka spruce is the only one we are torrifying and, and it's been that way for years. So we're, you know, for the, for the R and D question that was out there, this is one of those things that we're still trying and failing at a lot until we figure out something that makes sense. Andy. Well, yeah. and also to expand on that a little bit, Andy powers will say that it's not, it's not the cure all. It's not a magic bullet either. And um, he'll do it when he thinks it will add to the sound of a particular design of his. In a, in a body shape, a wood, a wood back and sides combination with a torrified top. But if it doesn't, it, he'll in Andy, you know, like Charlie said, we've got this R and D team that does a lot of testing, which we definitely do. We have a building full of brilliant people who do that. But Andy also kind of knows stuff already. Um, he just kind of knows things, right? <laughs> and and he, he'll Helps just it, it, on the water, it, you know, and. Um, so it's so you can he's like he's a lot like Bob in that way. I can remember when I first met Bob and I came to like my first Nam show and I was like, hey man, you know, I'm, I you know I finally had his ear for a second and I said, hey, you ever you ever thought about doing this? And he he was like looking at his watch and you know kind of listening <laughs> to me. And then he just he just he said, yeah, I did that 15 years ago. Here's why it doesn't work. You know, like and he, would, <laughs> he just kind of in a, not a very polite way, but he just was like was so far ahead of my little um, idea. And Andy's the same way with guitar building. It's amazing. Hey, Lund, yeah. I got a question, and then we'll take one more question for Charlie. Okay. Lindsay, if you want to take one more question for Charlie, but I got one for Andy. No. We've got somebody in the feed who's pretty frustrated. <laughs> and so I want to get right into this frustrating question. I get it. Sometimes people want to ask questions, and we don't answer everything. So I apologize. we got a lot of questions here. But this one in particular you might be able to help. This is a sales question and it has to do with a region outside of America. Why are our guitars or your guitars states so overpriced, overly priced in India? Would you have any idea why our guitars are so expensive in India? Because of the amount of import taxation that the distributor has to pay upon bringing the guitars into the, com into the country. Um, Every uh, you know, all distributors in other countries have to pay freight charges, and that's that's normal. But there are places in that we deal with where some countries pay about sixty percent tax on the invoice that we send them. Then they might have to add a, a GST tax on top of that, and then there might be something else on top of that as well. It's really uh, it gets back to like Charlie mentioned governments before. Um, it's very difficult for some of our other countries to do business with American goods because of the amount of taxation that happens at the dock when they receive the instruments. It has nothing to do with the retailers. The retailers would love to be able to keep the price um, in a in a range that would be more uh, um, less frustrating. Uh, <laughs> um, but that is the reality. I, I don't think that we we do not work with distributors nor retailers who are trying to gouge people with our brand. We don't, we don't do that. We get that question. This is, we can just we can just go right into this question too. We often get questions on social. So I oversee social media for Taylor. 
as some of you know. And we often get questions when we do sweepstakes or things like that, why we can't do sweepstakes all over the world. And the biggest one, to be honest, is, is Brazil. We get that question all the time. We know there are a lot of Taylor players in Brazil, but one of the reasons we can't is because, truthfully, it, it, it's as if the government won't let us, right? If we gave you a guitar as, at a sweepstakes winner received a guitar and they lived in Brazil, they would have to pay almost double the price for the instrument in tax. Yeah. So that is why some of these things don't happen. Some of it is out of our control. We try to do our best and we're, we're trying to get guitars everywhere. So that's that. Lindsay, do you have another question for? Let's go. Charlie? Yes. And then we'll go into, oh, we have a special, oh, we have, oh, we have some great stuff. We have some special All stuff. Right. All right, go. Here it is. Where is it at? Hold on. Hold on. Oh, there we go. Robert wants to know, how do you know if a wood is good to build a guitar? There's lots and lots of different types of wood out there. Yeah, great question. Um, well, the different types of wood, like I said, we there's a few of them that are tried and true. So we know, you know, mahogany and spruce and ebony and rosewood are, are always going to work um, for the most part. Um, but we don't know for some of these other species, we don't know. Um, a lot of the, you know, we, we know that, that a soft wood doesn't work for backs and sides. Um, so it makes, you know, it's pretty clear that you wouldn't build a spruce guitar out of, you know, a fully spruce guitar with backs and sides that, that just wouldn't sound very nice. And, and so there are certain things, you know, that we know that just work and don't work. Um, but if you take the hardwood category and then you narrow that down and say, well, you know, what are the density properties of the wood and, and what is it, um, what does the ring sound like? If you, for those of you who work with wood, you can tap on the wood and get kind of a resonance from it. So you, you get an idea of how, how it might ring. And, um, and there are lots of species out there that have this really great, uh, these great properties to it, but haven't been made into musical instruments yet, or maybe they're made with small parts, um, not really the, the front and center of it. And so the only way we really know is, is by building a guitar and then playing it. But certainly there are things we can do. Um, we talked a lot about smelling the wood and I've, I've actually seen Andy Powers once or twice lick a piece of wood. And so, you know, those are, yeah, it's true, but those are non-scientific ways. <laughs> Nonetheless, I think the idea here is for us to, to look at that whole, uh, the whole species and genus and figure out from that point on you know, is this even a viable candidate? And if it is, um, let's make it the guitar and see what it sounds like. Um, but there's some tried and trues that are out there and that's what we spend most of our time on. That's our bread and butter. Um, and so those are pretty straightforward, but it's always fun to, to experiment with something new. Mm. Or lick it. Yeah. Or, lick yeah, or lick it. Or, I mean, I admit that I've done it once or twice too, but only after he did. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother love that's a whole oh, for, oh, for oh, the wood species this is this is amazing all right so all right it's that time of the show. um this is this is the time of the show that we we in 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 episodes past we have we have, when sharpie was on the show we did it we did a a part of the show called sharpie's question all right so as to pay homage to Sharpie, we are mm. going to continue Sharpie's question. Sharpie's question. I got two <laughs> Sharpies with me right here, and we are going to take turns with Sharpie's question. This week, Sharpie's question is mine. Andy, do you have a song for us? Uh, I do, Jay. Amazing. Jay's got a question for Charlie. He's got a new role to fill. I guess we still call it Sharpie's question. We've got a few minutes to kill. <laughs> Here comes Parkins Sharpie's question. Yes. We did it. We did it. We kept Sharpie's question. It's so good. And next, yes. we're going to start a segment called Letters to Lindsay. So. What we need you to do is write your questions specifically about anything guitar related to Lindsay, and she will answer those questions. All right, All right. so Sharpie's question this week from Jay is, Charlie, you've been to a ton of countries out there. What is one country you haven't been to uh, yet, and why do you want to go there? Okay. Um, 
Are we talking strictly work? <laughs> nope. It could be. It could be, you know, just a vacation. It could be somewhere okay. you want to go in this world that you haven't been. Well, that's a great question. You know, um, I usually ask my wife these questions and then I just go with the flow. <laughs> but, you know, now that, sh that, that, that you're asking me, I think probably the one place that I have not been that I would love to go is New Zealand. I've never been there. And, um, which is crazy because I've been all over the region. I've just never been to New Zealand and I would love to go on vacation and not really think about work. <laughs> vacation, <laughs> what's that? That's why. Yeah, exactly. Have you ever been on vacation, Andy? Uh, yeah, I've been on vacation. I've been to New Zealand too. Ah. It's, it's mm. beautiful. And e hobbits live there. Yeah. yeah. Hobbit. So yeah, I would fit right in. Yeah, it's hobbits, hobbits. do it if you can figure it out, Charlie. And then you can stop. You can stop in Tasmania on the way back and check out some Blackwood too. So you right, can, and I and I could stop. I could stop at Fiji on the way back from there too. Yeah. So you know, I, so I, I think could build a work trip around this. You can do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. All right, you know what time it is? It's time for two minutes of sports. Andy, do you have a song for us? Two minutes of sports. We're gonna dive in right now. Two minutes of sports. I'm really excited. Take it away. One hundred. 20 seconds, no time in dog years. A 30th of an hour is the same as two minutes of sports. <laughs> this is what we deal with on a regular basis, Charlie. It's so good. We don't know what's coming, so it's good. All right, so Charlie, I wore this Cleveland hat for you and Gabe O'Brien, because he's in the feed. And the Cubs are playing the Indians right now, and I guess it's it is now tied. So that's what I ah. I just read this. So Cleveland, and it sounds eerily uh, familiar. Yeah, it's tied, uh, like mm. Game Seven of 2016 yeah. World Series. Okay, so the question is for you. It's really difficult. In 2019, <laughs> what was the record? Uh, the Cubs against the Tigers. What was the series record? For the entire season, do you know it? Oh, you mean Cleveland against the against the Tigers? Yeah. yeah. How okay. Many times did Cleveland well, let's see. How many times um, did the Tigers win? Well, the Tigers are terrible. Sorry, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. And I, I don't follow baseball as much as I used to, so you know I'm going to go out on a limb and say mm, Cleveland beat Detroit 100 percent of the time. <laughs> Close. Close. Oh, Close. okay. Sorry. Yeah. All right. I believe they won uh, 18 times and the Tigers won once. One. Okay. All right. Well, you know, they've earned it. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Maybe <laughs> we can just do this then. We'll give you an easier question. When was the last time that the <laughs> that Cleveland lost the World Series? That's a tough question. <laughs> Twenty. You know, I want to go. I want to go back to like nineteen seventy something. But you know, the fact is, is it was two thousand sixteen. Okay. And I won't <laughs> sleep very well tonight. And and it's it's almost embarrassing because they lost to the Cubs. Uh, but that's okay. It was a really good game. That it was, was a really good game. Arguably the best game seven of all time. So yeah, it totally I, was. I I was I I was rooting for the Cubs. However. I'm wearing a Cleveland hat, so it's okay. I like baseball. That was a good baseball. Yeah. All right. You know, I mean, if taking taking the, the 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 team loyalty out of it, it was probably one of the best games I had ever watched. That is. It was that good. It was that good. All right. You know what time it is? It's trivia time. All right. So we have two prizes this week. Uh, they're the same. We're going to we're going to have two winners. Um, each winner is going to receive a nice little fun assorted Taylor pick pack. Where did it go? Taylor picks and a capo, Taylor capo. So two winners and here. So there's two questions. All right. Question number one, you guys ready for this? You guys ready? So what's awkward here, t t uh, Charlie, is that the feed has to catch up cause there's a delay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Andy plays a little bit of mood music as we ask. The I question. was I was going to suggest a drum roll, but maybe mood music is better. Being that we're talking, we don't. I don't. I don't have any drums. With it. I do in the other room, but we'll, we'll t get to that later. Okay. So, <laughs> in what year? Question number one. Oh yeah. Here are the rules. 
Here are the rules. The questions go like this. Gabe O'Brien cannot answer the questions. <laughs> that is the rule. The first person to answer it right or correctly in the feed has to email us at primetime at taylorguitars.com with all your information, and we will send you the prizes. All right, here we go, right? For your picks and your capo. In what year was the Grand Auditorium first released? In what year was the Grand Auditorium first released? Are you going to play some mood music? My daughter, she's having a good time having a party behind us. Good for her. I, I, thought, I thought Andy suddenly had children and he was chasing them around. Good for her. Good Ooh. Ooh, they're coming in. They are. They are. They're coming in. Robert. Robert. All right. Robert Braun, 1994. Robert Braun. You got it. The answer is 1994. Now they're all coming in. This is mm -hmm. fun, right? Mm -hmm. All right, Robert, email us at Taylor Guitars. Or excuse me, uh, primetime at taylorguitars.com and we will get you your, your fun pack of picks and a capo. All right, 2016. Um, 2000, Daria Musk says. All right, here we go. The next question is, this is a good one. This is, this is one of those quizzes at the end of the show, right? Uh, you must have been listening. Oh, is Andy muted? It, are you muted? No, I just think it was quiet, too quiet. Okay, Andy, here we go. He's just quiet. He was holding his breath. He was being sensitive. He was being sensitive. All right, cool. Here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this question in. You had to pay attention to Charlie. Okay, ready? Where do we source most of our... Well, maybe we should put body part on here, huh? neck for the neck where do we source the maple that we use on guitar necks there it is <laughs> huge delay huge delay i saw the answers before here's the question oh what a bummer Nope, we're talking maple. We're talking maple, not... Ooh. No one was listening to that part. Ooh. Nobody's paying attention. Tobias said... Eastern U.S.? Correct. That's right. Eastern U.S. Got it. Where'd you go? Evan Smith. Evan, Evan Smith. Smith. Evan Smith, Eastern U.S. You are right. And right after that was, was North America. Hey, you know what? Maybe which we'll we would have taken. To the, what's that? I said, which we might have taken. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> right. We, we were almost going to take that one. Someone <laughs> slid in there with the right one. Eastern U.S. All right, Evan, send us an email. Send us an email at primetime at taylorguitars.com. All right. It is that time where we're going to wrap up the show. We've gone a little long, but man, what a nerdy, fun subject this was. Charlie Redden, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. That was incredible. If you guys have any more questions for Charlie, don't be afraid to send them to Taylor or to primetime at taylorguitars.com. Thanks, Sharpie, for watching because I know you were. We have you in our hearts, my friend. And welcome to the show, yeah. Lindsay. That is, it's going to be fun. We got a it's lot of so stuff. Fun. All right. So next week, we have a, a, a segment called Letters to Lindsay. Mm -hmm. And we need you to send letters to primetime at taylorguitars.com any sort of story or any sort of question or anything that you just need to talk about guitar related, send it to Lindsay at basketball Ron related. What do you want? Basketball Ask related, basketball related, LeBron James. Somebody right. said something about the lake show, the lake show. You got it. All right. Thanks guys. <laughs> thanks for watching. Thanks again for another awesome episode of Taylor primetime. We've finally done 17 things and it was fantastic. <laughs> Charlie, you've been amazing. Andy, you want to take it away? Wishing the best for old Sharpie Wherever he may roam A huge welcome to Lindsay In your new prime time home <laughs> <laughs> Well
What time was it? What time was it? It was prime time. Prime time. What time was it? What was that? Well, I, you know, that was prime time. I've got it. Charlie had the answers. Helped us all to understand. Where does all of this wood come from? He's a Cleveland baseball fan. <laughs> Maple from North America. Ebony from Cameroon. Ash from California. This song can end too soon. On prime time. On Tuesdays. That was prime time on Tuesday. Thank you, Charlie. See you guys next week, everybody. Take care. Peace. Thanks.